Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about some advanced topics in linear algebra. And in today's part 50, we will discuss singular values and singular vectors for a matrix. Indeed, these notions make sense for every complex valued matrix and they are needed to define the singular value decomposition. In fact, after watching this video, you will already be able to write down the whole procedure to construct the singular value decomposition. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, with a membership on Steady, you can download a lot of additional material for the videos. Okay, and now for the start, let's look again at the general picture for the singular value decomposition. There we have the vector space Cn on the left hand side and Cm on the right hand side. And going from left to right, we have our general linear map L. And as you already know, we can always represent such a linear map by a matrix with respect to the standard basis. So we have n canonical unit vectors on the left hand side and m on the right hand side. And in order to keep it simple, let's call the standard basis curved em on the right hand side and curved en on the left hand side. Hence the corresponding basis isomorphisms are just given by the identity maps. This means not much happens here, we just map to cn and cm trivially. However, as always it makes sense to distinguish these two levels because here on the concrete level, we have our matrix representation A. And you see in general, this is a rectangular matrix and the singular value decomposition wants to diagonalize that one. And this is done by choosing a different basis V here, which also should consist of N vectors. And moreover, like the standard basis, it should also be an O and B with respect to the standard inner product. And a similar thing should happen on the right hand side where we choose an O and B U. Of course, this one now should have M vectors in the basis. So the two things imply that now we might get some interesting basis isomorphisms. So what we do here is a change of basis such that the corresponding matrix representation is a diagonal matrix which we call sigma. So this is the whole picture of the singular value decomposition. On the one hand, we have two O and B's here, and on the other hand, we want to get a diagonal matrix out. And usually one puts everything into the matrix language, which means we would talk about the transformation matrices here on the left hand side and here on the right hand side. For example, on the left hand side, we would have the change of basis matrix T, where the basis V goes in and the standard basis En comes out. And the common notation is that we put this into the index with an arrow. And a similar thing we have here on the right hand side, where the basis U goes in and Em goes out. And now it's not hard to see what this actually means, because if we look at the first column, it would be the first vector in the basis U represented with respect to the standard basis. In other words, it's simply our first vector u1 as a column vector. So not so complicated, we just have all the vectors in the basis u from u1 to um as columns in the matrix. And therefore we will just call it the matrix capital U. And in the same way, we can discuss the same thing on the left hand side where we have the v vectors in the columns. And for this reason, we call that matrix simply capital V. And there we have everything. Now we can see A is given as a composition where we first apply the inverse of V, then sigma, and in the end U. And we can write it as a matrix product, which means we have A is equal to U times sigma times V star, because V star is exactly the inverse of V, because we have an O and B in the columns, which means we have a unitary matrix. Therefore, the only question we have here is how do we choose the two O and Bs such that our sigma is a diagonal matrix? And as you might already expect, in this video we will answer that question. And the procedure is as follows. 
if we want to get the requirement out, we can assume that we already have such a decomposition where sigma is diagonal and we see what this implies. And in fact, this will give us the correct O and Bs in the end. And maybe first as a reminder, this picture here tells us that the two matrices A and sigma are equivalent because they both represent the same linear map. And indeed, we have already discussed this equivalence property in some other videos, and we know it says something about the rank of the two matrices. Namely, the rank is an invariant for the given equivalence relation, which means it cannot change if we go to a different equivalent matrix. Moreover, we also know that the rank completely determines the given equivalence class. However, for us now it's only important that we have a fixed number r, for the rank of both matrices. And obviously this number cannot be bigger than the number of the columns of A or the number of the rows of A. So this is something you should already remember for the singular value decomposition. The number of non-zero entries in our sigma is definitely less or equal than the minimum between N and M. And now the general assumption we want to consider is that we already have such a singular value decomposition for a given matrix A. This means for a rectangular matrix A, we find two O and Bs, or two matrices U and V, such that the picture from above is correct. Hence our matrix sigma is in diagonal form. And moreover, the non-zero entries we have in sigma, we call S1, S2, and so on. And now since the rank is given by R, we have exactly R of them. Hence we would rearrange the O and Bs such that these diagonal entries that are non-vanishing are at the beginning. So you could say we have a block matrix in such a way that all the other entries are zero. And please don't forget, it still has to be rectangular in the same shape as A. Okay, and here we know that A is equal to U times sigma times V star so we can also bring V star to the left hand side. This is helpful because we can just compare two simple matrix products. And again as a reminder, A and sigma have the same rectangular shape, but U and V are square matrices which could have different shapes. Therefore the visualization of these two matrix products could look like this. So please keep this in mind, because now we want to do this calculation explicitly. So let's start with the left hand side, let's multiply A with V. And as we already know, V simply has the O and B in the columns, so we have the vector V1, V2 and so on. Therefore we can just apply A to each column separately. So not complicated at all, the first column is just AV1. So this is already good enough for the left hand side and now we can do a similar thing with the right hand side. There we have u times sigma where u is also given by the O and B in the columns. The only difference is now that we have m vectors. And now we multiply this by sigma which is a diagonal matrix with r entries. So you see also this matrix product is quite simple because we can just scale the columns of U with the entries in sigma. So more precisely, the first column is S1 times U1. And this continues until we have SR times UR. And depending on the relation between R, M and N, we also have some zero columns at the end. So also in the case that the rectangular form looks like this, it could happen that we have some zero columns. And with that we are done and we get our first result which is given by n vector equalities. Simply because we know the two matrices have to coincide, so the first column is equal to this first column here. Or more precisely, AV1 is equal to S1 times U1. And this repeats until our index here is given by R. And then the next vector equalities have the zero vector on the right hand side. So since we have n vectors, we also get out n equalities. And in fact, the last ones definitely tell us something about the kernel of A, and the first ones, they look like eigenvalue equalities. 
It looks similar, but of course it's not the same because we don't have the same vector on the left and the right of the equation. However, we have scalars involved and we will see that these are connected to eigenvalues of a particular matrix. However, first you should see that we can repeat this calculation for the adjoint of A as well. This means we can use the singular value decomposition for A to also get one for A star. This is quite clear because we just have to put the star to the multiplication of u with sigma and v star. And this simply results in v times sigma star times u star. And there sigma star is also in diagonal form, so we can just repeat the same calculation as before. The only difference is now that u is on the left hand side and v on the right hand side. And moreover, a star and sigma star have the rectangular form flipped compared to a and sigma. Which also already tells us that in this case we get m vector equalities out. Otherwise I would say we don't have to repeat the whole calculation because it works exactly the same. So the first thing we get is a star u1 is equal to s1 overline times v1. So please don't forget, the entries in sigma are complex numbers, so the star will use the complex conjugation on them. And again, this whole procedure repeats until we reach the index r. And then maybe just some zero columns will remain. And here you can note, these last equations say something about the kernel of a star. Okay, and now in the next step, we can just put both our results together and then we see something really helpful. So for example, we can take the first equation from one and then we apply the adjoint of A to both sides. Which simply implies that on the right hand side we find the first equation of two. So what we get is S1 together with the complex conjugate of S1. And most importantly, we have the same vector V1 on the left hand side and the right hand side. Hence now we definitely have an eigenvalue equation. Namely, V1 is an eigenvector of the matrix A star A. And the corresponding eigenvalue is S1 in the absolute value squared. And obviously we can extend this result to all the other indices until we reach R. So this is really nice because now we have reduced the problem to an eigenvalue problem. Or to say it more precisely, if we have a singular value decomposition for the matrix A, then we necessarily have eigenvectors for the matrix A star A. And we know even more, these eigenvectors have to form an O and B. And there we already learned that this is a really strong requirement and only possible for normal matrices. However, now the good thing is, this combination A star A is definitely a normal matrix. Indeed, it's even better because this matrix is a self-adjoint matrix. You can immediately check that, just apply the star operator to it and you see it will not change at all. So our result here is quite nice. We know we have the spectral theorem for such matrices and our requirement we get can always be satisfied. It's always possible to construct such an O and B as we need it. And this immediately leads us to the definition of the singular values and the singular vectors for a given matrix A. So the first observation is that A star A is a self-adjoint matrix and the second observation is that all the eigenvalues have to be non-negative. This is quite easy to show and it also fits in with the equation from before. And since we actually want to talk about the numbers as K itself, we have to take the square root of the eigenvalues. And we make the whole thing unique by saying that we take the positive square root. And moreover then we can also order them and say that S1 is the largest of them. And now since we have n eigenvalues of A star A counted with the algebraic multiplicity in mind, we can also say that we have n of these positive square roots. So the last entry should be Sn. So there we have it, these are the numbers that are important for us 
and these are called the singular values of the matrix A. So please keep in mind, A star A is a square matrix, but A could be a rectangular matrix. Moreover, we can also define the singular vectors for the matrix A if we apply our spectral theorem. More precisely, we apply it to our normal matrix A star A, where we know that an O and B consisting of eigenvectors exists. This means Vk here is an eigenvector associated to the eigenvalue Sk squared. And these eigenvectors for A star A are actually called the right singular vectors for A. We say right singular because in the singular value decomposition of A, we find the matrix V on the right hand side. Hence the left singular vectors are actually the vectors in the matrix U. There the idea is exactly the same, we apply the spectral theorem, but now to the normal matrix A A star. And there we have our vectors U K with the same eigenvalues. So you see this is not so complicated, it's just applying the two equations we had from before in a different order. And therefore, these are now called the left singular vectors of our matrix A. And now the only thing that remains to show is that with these vectors that definitely exist, we can form our singular value decomposition. This means if you put the left singular vectors into a matrix U and the right singular vectors into a matrix V, we get this matrix product for A. Of course, the calculation from before already showed that, but we will discuss it in more detail in the next videos. In fact, I also want to show you an explicit example calculation for the singular value decomposition. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.